This film explores the history and the present day lives of the Jamesport, Missouri Old Order Amish, their ideology and adherence to a creed of simplicity in the fast paced, high tech world of 21st century America. In 1953, seven Amish families purchased farmland south of Jamesport, Missouri and established a new colony. They came from Ohio, Indiana, and Illinois in search of fertile and affordable farmland in the heartland of the country. The community now consists of 147 families, owning approximately 12,000 acres of land, making this the largest Old Order Amish settlement west of the Mississippi River. The Amish descended from a group of Dutch Anabaptists known as Mennonites, named after their founder, Menno Simons. Simons, a former Catholic priest, set down the rules and the core beliefs in 1632, which included supreme authority of the Bible, adult baptism, the Trinity, and a belief in the separation of church and state. Named for their founder, Jacob Amon, the Amish split from the Mennonites in 1693. Amon believed that the Mennonites had drifted away from their original beliefs and practices. In fear of persecution, they worshiped in members' homes as opposed to church buildings, hence are sometimes called the House Amish. During a period in European history when other Christian faiths imprisoned, executed, and tortured nonconformists for heresy, both groups rejected these practices in favor of a nonviolent approach known as mending or shunning. Shunning requires that all church members temporarily sever all communications with a fallen member until he or she repents. The practice was based on St. Paul's writings, Romans 16, chapter 17. Now I beseech you, brethren, mark them which cause divisions and offenses contrary to the doctrine which ye have learned and avoid them. Choosing the simple life, the Amish live their lives in accordance with Christ's teaching of the path to the kingdom of heaven, a non-violent, non-materialistic life. Today, their lifestyle continues to include horse-drawn transportation, face-to-face -face social and business interactions, and worship service in family homes. The first Amish immigrated to America in the late 17th century. In 1681, William Penn, an English Quaker, was granted a parcel of land by King Charles II, which would later become Pennsylvania. Penn was a Quaker who sought to establish a land of liberal and tolerant views that was godly, virtuous, and exemplary for all humanity. He recognized a kindred spirit in the Amish and invited them to join. They have flourished in America and now have about 180,000 adult members in 22 states and also in Canada. In 1963, the federal government handed down a ruling that allowed the Amish to establish their own school system. There are six colonies in the area and each colony has its own school. The schools are located centrally within the colony. However, some of the children still have to walk up to one and a half miles to attend the school. There are no SUVs or soccer moms here. The Army School is a one-room schoolhouse divided by a curtain down the middle. The grades are divided into two groups. Each group is taught by one, sometimes two, teachers. Single Amish girls are hired as teachers within the clan, having completed the eighth grade themselves. There is no cafeteria. There are no inside toilets. The children pack their own lunch to school. They have an hour for lunch, during which they go out and play softball. Incidentally, the Amish children do not have a problem with obesity or diabetes. Each morning, devotions are held and the Lord's Prayer is read in unison. But the Amish want the Bible to be taught and interpreted only in the home and the church. The Amish have never proselytized to recruit members, so the children are truly prized as the future of the Amish faith. The Amish believe that children are a gift from God and are naturally willful. 
Parents are morally accountable to God for providing the training and the discipline necessary to create loving and responsible adults. Ministers at the Amish minister meeting of 1873 admonished parents. Take very great care, you to whom care of your children is so highly and preciously commanded, that you bring them up from youth in the admonition of the Lord, for this is the greatest and most noble duty of the Christian. Given this imperative, discipline is not an issue for the Amish school teacher. The Amish are totally involved with their children in school activities. Rumspringa is a traditional rite of passage in the Amish religion and describes a period lasting months or even years during which adolescents are released from the church and its rules. The custom is part of the Amish belief that only informed adults can accept Christ and be baptized, along with the belief that the unbaptized cannot enter the kingdom of heaven. Loosely translated, Rumspringa means to search or to look out. Both the boys and girls go through this rite of passage in their lives. They are given a new or reconditioned buggy and horse. Some of their wagons are equipped with a boom box and sometimes fuzzy dies. Those who want to make a real statement put bumper stickers over their slow moving vehicle sign on the back of their buggy. They are free to cut their hair in the English style and to don English clothes. Room Springer gives the Amish kids a chance to sample the English lifestyle before they join the church and settle down to raising a family. I would estimate that over 98% stay in the colony and join the church. Even some of those who have left have come back later. They are welcomed back to the Amish church. Drugs, with the exception of alcohol, are not a problem in this community. And with alcohol, they usually get it out of their system before joining the church. The Amish community offers many things to their young that we have lost in our fast-paced society. They have their brothers and sisters and the support of extended families in the colony. Freedom is sweet for a young and healthy 17-year-old who has spent their lives on the farm, and being set free can be a little daunting. However, after a period of time, the outside life can grow weary, and they soon return back to the simpler lifestyle. The Old Order Amish are sometimes referred to as the House Amish. In Europe, they were persecuted for their religious beliefs. In order to escape persecution, they would gather in their homes to conduct their worship service. To this day, worship service is still conducted in their homes. Their singing form also originated from the days of persecution. The slow, chant-like stanzas mask the joyful praises to God. The community shares a church wagon that contains benches, hymnals, and service settings necessary for hosting a large group of people. The wagon is used for church, weddings, and funerals. The hosting family receives the wagon on Friday preceding the Sunday church service, allowing them time to set up the benches. Amish do not believe in doing any type of labor or business on Sunday. Sunday is a day of rest to be spent with the family. All meal preparations must be done on Friday or Saturday. The worship service starts at 9 a.m. and lasts until after 1 p.m., a long time to sit on wooden church benches. If they do take communion, the service may last until 5 p.m. The worship service is conducted in Low German. The minister reads from the Gutenberg Bible, which is also in German. Married men and women are segregated in the worship service. The Amish in this area are permitted to play one instrument, and that is a harmonica. It is not that they do not enjoy music, they do. But the rules prohibit them from owning or listening to any English music. By the way, anyone in this area that does not belong to the Amish church is referred to as the English. 
After joining the church, the women no longer cut their hair. This is taken literally from St. Paul's letter to the Corinthians, chapter 11, verses 5 through 7. St. Paul admonishes women to honor their heads and keep them covered. The females all cover their heads with a prayer cap, bonnet, or scarf. You will never see an Amish woman, girl, or child without some type of head covering. The Amish young adults meet one another and date in much the same ways as young people anywhere. They are free to select their own mates and are usually in their 20s when they decide to join the church and marry. An Amish wedding is a big event. It will last all day and as many as 400 guests will be invited. The wedding service and singing is all in German. Gifts given to the bride and groom might include food, kitchenware, linens, towels, tools, or lawn furniture. The bride will select an Amish friend or relative to make the wedding cake, which will be beautiful. It will usually take two days to prepare everything and get the long table set up for the feast. Before beginning to eat, there will be a quiet prayer. While the servers are doing their work, the guests will sing a song, often God is the Liebe, God's love's eternal. The new couple will move into their new home the day after the wedding. The groom will have a job as his father would have taught him all about making a living. He will farm, be a carpenter, or work at one of the sawmills. The bride's mother will have taught her to cook, sew, keep the house clean, or how to freeze vegetables, and how to garden. Prior to a marriage, a girl may have a part-time job doing housework, babysitting, working in one of the Amish stores or teaching school. After marriage, a woman no longer works outside the home. Once married, an Amish man no longer shaves his beard. The Amish do not wear any type of jewelry, including wedding rings. This is a very typical Amish kitchen with handcrafted cabinets and a stainless steel sink. Everything is very orderly in an Amish home, and nothing is there that doesn't have a practical use. All of the Amish homes in the area have indoor plumbing. Kerosene refrigerators, yes, kerosene, is used by the Amish. These are very expensive units made in Sweden. This unit uses approximately one gallon of kerosene a week. Most of the foods they eat are canned out of their large gardens. The kerosene stove is used to cook their meals and bake the breads. The stove has burners just like your modern stoves. The Amish also use wood to heat their water. This heater has a 50 gallon tank and a 50 gallon reserve tank. The water heater also has to be stoked twice daily. The Amish use a white gas light fixture to illuminate their homes at night. Usually there is one, maybe two lamps lit in the evening. These are similar to the Coleman gas lanterns used by campers. The lamp gets its light from a mesh-like wick called a generator. This generator must be preheated with a match, or in this case, a butane torch. The Amish have their own weekly newspaper called The Budget. It is printed in Sugar Creek, Ohio, and is well over 100 years old. This newspaper is circulated to all the Amish in the United States and Canada. Each community has its own newsletter, and one person from that community writes in to the budget, listing deaths, births, weddings, and other happenings in that particular community. The Amish can keep up with their friends and relatives all over the country. It is standard reading material that you will find in any Amish home. Health care and health care expenses are a major issue among the Amish, just as they are to millions of other Americans. Very few families carry health insurance and do not believe in taking government assistance, therefore do not participate in the Medicaid, Medicare systems. Often, when a family has a large medical bill, the community will work together and have some type of fundraising project. These events are well publicized, attended and supported by both Amish and English. 
When health care problems occur, they will seek treatment at the local hospital or physician's office. A midwife in this area will get a lot of practice because the average Amish family will have between seven and nine children. There are families who have as many as 15 children. Most of the time, a young expectant mother will go to the hospital to have her first child and will have the remainder at home with the assistance of a midwife and friends or family members. The daughter of a friend recently gave birth to her first baby at home without complications. The delivery fee at the local hospital would have been about $7,000. The average lifespan of the Amish people in this area is about the same as that of the English. The Amish pay local, state, and federal taxes, and in addition, a head tax on their schools. However, they are exempt from the Social Security system. I have never heard the word retire in the Amish community. The elderly do not slow down in their senior years, but continue to work performing useful chores around the farm while retaining a strong sense of independence. After their children are raised and leave home, the parents usually sell the home place to the eldest son and move into a smaller house called a grandpa or dotty house. Their children situate the house adjacent to the main farmhouse to provide easy access. The family members take turns caring for their elderly parents. They would not think of putting them in a rest home or an extended living home. Instead, they are allowed to live out their lives naturally and with dignity as opposed to machines and drugs to keep them alive. An Amish funeral is celebrated as a passing on to a better life. The state requires the body to be prepared by a licensed mortician. However, the body is returned to the home in a coffin fashioned out of pine or oak by the local cabinet maker. The body lies in state for 48 hours. The neighbors all help out during this time. On the day of the burial, the coffin is carried to the cemetery in an enclosed horse-drawn hearse followed by all the friends and relatives in buggies. As many as 50 buggies may be in the procession. The passing of a loved one is a tragedy. However, it is also a time for rejoicing because the Amish have lived their whole life for this occasion. There are four Amish sawmills in the Jamesport area. The mills are powered by stationary diesel engines. Mainly, cottonwood logs are brought to the mill on trucks operated by local English drivers. Once the logs are received, they are dragged to the saws by large draft horses. The logs are then rolled onto a sliding carriage that feeds them into two large diameter saw blades. The work is very noisy and very dangerous. The logs are sawed into slabs and then resawed into small boards. These boards are bundled and loaded on a flatbed truck that takes them to the Amish pallet factory. The boards are then resawn to size and nailed into finished pallets. The Amish buggy is a delicate but strong vehicle constructed of one half inch plywood with oak bracing for the roof. Construction starts with a square box for the subframe and then the upper body is attached. David Yoder, the local buggy maker, makes on the average of 12 buggies per year. After your order is placed, the wait time can be up to two months. In addition to making new buggies, he also restores old buggies carriages, and horse-drawn sleds. Buggies have a long life, and it is not unusual for buggies to be over 30 years old. Detroit could sure take a lesson from the Amish. To tour David's workshop is like stepping back in time. In a dimly lit, dusty workshop, 
wooden parts, patterns, vinyl fabric, and special tools hang from the walls and ceiling. All his work is either done by hand or with a gasoline-powered table saw. The local wheelwright makes the wheels and chassis. There you go. This ancient art is alive and doing well in the Jamesport area. I had the opportunity to visit one of the wheelwrights and observe firsthand how the wheels are constructed. Today, he is rebuilding wheels for a stagecoach. The work is hard and dangerous, especially when you are lifting and fitting the hot steel bands or tire that is shrunk fit around the oak spokes and fellows. Fellows are the pieces that form the oak circle. For these particular wheels, he purchases the hubs and spokes from the Amish in Ohio and fashions the fellows to complete the outer circle. The iron bands are cut and welded to the correct cold diameter. The cold diameter must be just right so that when the metal is heated, it will slip over the wheel. Sometimes a big hammer helps. The iron tire is taken out of the fire and fitted over the wooden wheel, then cooled with water, and after it cools and shrinks, you have a tight fit. Wheel choice is either fiberglass or wooden spokes with or without rear brakes. The total price for a completed two-door model 2006 buggy would be approximately $3,200, depending upon options. Options for the buggy would be either two or four-door models and any color as long as it is black. The seats are covered with a soft fabric and available in blue, black, maroon, or green. The young Amish boy is harrowing the field. The land was first plowed with horse-drawn plows and then disc. After disking, the soil is then harrowed to make it smooth for planting. This is a very time-consuming process and not practical by the English farmers. English farmers usually make two passes over their fields, one to break up the soil and the second time to plant and lay down the herbicide. However, the Amish do not have the high cost of farming like diesel tractors, diesel fuel, and machinery. With diesel fuel costs soaring, the Amish farmer may be the only one that prevails. Shocking oats is a very ancient and labor-intensive method of harvesting the oat grain. The Amish still use this time-honored agricultural practice. They use a horse-drawn machine that cuts the stems of the oats and rolls them into a bundle that is then tied with a string. After the bundle is dried in the sun, they are loaded onto a horse-drawn wagon and taken to the thrashing machine. These machines were manufactured in the early 1900s and many are still in use by the Amish today. The bundles are fed into the conveyor heads first and run through a hammer mill that separates the oats from the chaff. This is a John Deere round baler that has been converted from tractor drawn to horse drawn. The rubber tires have been removed and replaced with steel wheels. I am constantly amazed by the Amish, how they can take something from the modern world and adapt it to their simple, low-tech world. Annually, the Graber family hosts an auction on their farm. Every year, the auction grows larger and larger, with more people and more merchandise being brought in. Commission proceeds are donated to two Amish school districts. To observe the people at the auction is a study in religion. All religious sects attend from Schwarzentroopers, German Baptists, River Brethren, Dunkards, and Black Cap Mennonites. Practically anything that runs on kerosene can be purchased at the auction. Water heaters, refrigerators, stoves, lamps, kitchen ranges, and the list goes on and on. Today we are visiting Moe's Burkholder's shop where he makes leather horse collars. He told me that there are only 15 of these machines still functioning in the United States. This particular machine was made in the late 1800s. The machine runs off a line shaft that is powered by a stationary gasoline engine. The collar is first stuffed with a special long wheat straw which is grown by Moe's. 
then hammered flat on a hammer mill. Believe me, this won't pass OSHA inspection. Moe's collar prices range from $150 to $250. Additionally, Amish families earn a living through quilting, furniture making, baking, and training and outfitting horses. Others own and operate shops that offer quality handcrafted Amish products. Visitors come to this Amish settlement from virtually all over the world and from every walk of life. We have had monks from China and South Korea, dignitaries from Russia and computer engineers from San Jose, all on the same tour. Why do they come here and what is it that they're expecting to see? They may come out of a curiosity or a desire to purchase Amish made goods, but I believe that they go away with a sense of respect and admiration for the community, family life, and simplicity that they see here. Something about the Amish beckons us. Maybe we're reminded of our childhood days when life was safe and simple. All we had to worry about was getting enough friends in the neighborhood to form a ball team, or waiting for our relatives to arrive on Sunday so we could go outside with our cousins and play in the fresh green grass all day long. We would put the game on hold when we were summoned to come in for an Amish-style Sunday dinner with fried chicken and real mashed potatoes and gravy, corn on the cob with apple pie for dessert, at a time when all the stores were closed on Sunday so we could focus on our families. Maybe it is to escape our troubled times, to find a few hours of peace in our heart to shed the worries of this life and transcend into a life without the noise of mass media and political spin, to hear the smoothing rhythm of steel wheel buggies and horses hooves on unpaved roads, to let our inner soul escape to a place where it wants to dwell. Yes, we have lost this lifestyle in our sprawling suburbs. Our children no longer play outside, wrapped in the safety of our neighborhoods. Maybe the Amish have preserved the true American lifestyle.